Over the centuries, some 10 million people left the island of Ireland. Now you can travel in their footsteps and discover how this small island made such a big impression on the world. Experience over 300 remarkable tales of adventure, sacrifice and triumph. Follow their hopes and dreams. Celebrate their victories. See life through their eyes. Uncover rogues and wretches and their notorious legacies. Sing the songs they took with them and dance to their tune. Be inspired by their creativity. Hear their captivating stories. Explore new worlds and meet some unforgettable characters. Journey through 1,500 years of Irish history, brought to life like never before, at the world's first fully digital museum. Epic, the Irish Emigration Museum. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us on our live stream today. In our recent live streams, we've talked about a couple of things that we offer as part of our packages with tenantors, including whiskey tasting in Scotland, um, whale watching in Iceland, and touring around the Puglia and Tuscany regions of Italy, to name but a few. This time we're talking about things a little bit closer to home for me because I'm based in Dublin, Ireland, and we're focusing today on the mark that the Irish have left on the world through emigration. And we'll also talk a little bit about how you can start on tracing your own family tree if that's something that you've been wanting to do. Um, this evening is 8 p.m. here in Dublin. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by David Cleary from Epic Emigration Museum, who's standing by there. We've just seen their great video that gives us a, a really good overview of the museum. And what we're going to do is we're going to have a chat about the museum, first of all. And then in the second part of our chat, we're going to talk about the Irish Family History Centre. During the presentation today, you're going to have lots of opportunities to ask questions. So please feel free to add them at any stage and we'll be watching out for them and relay them to David. We'll also have two opportunities for you to win some prizes. The first prize will be for some tenant tours, travel accessories. And then the second prize will be for a free VIP tour of Epic Emigration Museum with a 60 minute consultation with the genealogy consultant there. And that would be as part of a package booked through tenant tours. And we'll arrange that with David for you. So with that said, let's say hello to David and good evening. Thanks for joining us. And um, first of all, we should say congratulations to Epic on winning the award for Europe's leading tourist attraction for the second year in a row, which is pretty amazing. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that award and who you beat to win it? Absolutely. Good evening, Liz. Uh, good afternoon to all of you watching in the States. I'm delighted to be joining you here to tell you a little bit about the museum. Uh, for those of you that saw the video at the start, hopefully that just gives you a little bit of a sense um, and a flavour of what we offer in the museum. Uh, nothing is like being there in person, like any trip to Ireland or any vacation that you go to Dublin. Uh, to, to see it live and to see it in person um, is really the, the, the best thing. Uh, but hopefully today, between the video and, and a little bit of a talk, um, and some of the pictures that I want to bring you through over the next couple of minutes, you'll get a bit of a sense uh, of, of the story that we tell and what we offer. Uh, so as Liz did mention, we are still celebrating over here in Ireland, in Dublin. Uh, we recently won back-to-back -back, um, World Travel Awards as Europe's leading tourist attraction. Uh, and as Liz mentioned, we beat some, some pretty special places, the Colosseum in Rome, the Eiffel Tower, Buckingham Palace, the Acropolis. Uh, so we're, something we're very, very proud of. Uh, to win over the last two years and it's it's uh, it's an awards that is voted for by the people that have visited the museum so something really really special and something more we're proud of and hopefully after today uh, you'll get to understand a little bit more of the reasons why so Liz if you're happy with me I'm going to bring you through some of our slides and tell uh, just congratulations again it's a, it's a great achievement uh, one thing before you do get started David I am going to run through our first prize question for today to get people happy. started on that one so this prize will be for the tenant tours travel accessories and the hint is that you are going to hear the answer to this question somewhere in David's presentation when he gets going so um, pay attention. The question is how many Americans approximately we're not looking for an exact figure claim Irish heritage the first person to answer correctly will win the prize and now I'm going to hand over to David to start his presentation. 
Great, thank you. I'll have to remember to, to give the answer to this yeah, <laughs> at some stage. I know. Um, <laughs> so the first thing that I want to show you is our location. This is where Epic, the Irish Immigration Museum, is located. We are right in the heart of Dublin city centre. So for those of you that are familiar with Ireland, Dublin is our capital city. We are on the east coast of the island. Uh, one of the oldest cities in, in, in Ireland itself. Uh, and the city is split into two by the River Liffey. Uh, it's a famous, um, famous river, uh, lots of songs written about it. And we are, are proud to be located right on the River Liffey in a beautiful CHQ building that you see on the north side of the city here. And this CHQ building, there's a lot of history in the actual building itself. It's an old whiskey, wine and tobacco warehouse. It's over 200 years old. So in the vaults of the building where they used to store the barrels of whiskey and wine and where they used to store the tobacco is where our beautiful museum is located, epic. It's down in the vaults of the CHQ building. I also just want to point out a couple of other things uh, that are very close by in the city. We have the beautiful Jeannie Johnson famine ship, which is located on the River Liffey, right beside Epic. Uh, and that is a replica famine ship that tells the story of Irish emigrants that would have left Ireland during the Great Potato Famine from 1845 to 1852. Uh, a lot of its journeys would have gone to North America with most of them going to Canada, but it did go to, uh, to the US as well. Uh, and that's a replica famine ship that is now a museum telling the story of those people. We also have the famine sculptures as well here on the north side of, of the River Liffey Banks. Um, so between the famine sculptures, these are haunting, haunting statues of people that would have walked uh, hundreds of miles from all over Ireland um, to board a boat to kind of bring them to, to their new life. Um, Dublin itself is quite a um, compact city. Uh, for those of you that may have been there before, or those of you that are looking to go on your vacation next year or the year after, uh, it's a city that you can really easily walk around. Uh, we always um, recommend that people can kind of walk around the city in a couple of days and, and just spend time soaking up the atmosphere. Epic is really well located in Dublin's Docklands area. We're a 12 minute walk to Trinity College, which is one of the most famous uh, places in the city itself. So it just gives you a bit of a sense of how central in the city we are. These uh, images that you can see on screen here just give you a little bit of a sense of what the city looks like down where we are in Dublin's Docklands area. Um, lots of new buildings, lots of um, culture and heritage in the area. On the top left, you get to see what the um, famine statues actually look like. And we have some visuals of the Jeannie Johnson famine ship. So as I mentioned, this is a museum now that tells the story of Irish people that would have left from the the, the uh, Irish potato famine uh, in the mid 19th century. So it's moored right on the River Liffey outside CHQ building, which is the building you can see here on the right hand side. This is this old whiskey, wine and tobacco warehouse and Epic is located in its vault, in its vaults. Uh, on the left, you'll see our latest award for the World Travel Award. And we are still the reigning uh, winner of Europe's leading tourist attraction, something that we're very, very proud of. So just some of the next few slides that I want to bring you through um, is understanding what Epic tells the story of. Uh, it is in the title. We are the Irish Immigration Museum. And what we do is we essentially want to discover why Irishness is celebrated around the world. Um, every people around the world have their own uh, stereotypes. Their people have a, their own idea about what it means to be Irish or what it means to be French or German or American or Spanish. Um, and some of these would have come from people emigrating from an island. And this is the story that we tell uh, in Epic. Over 1500 years of our history, we bring people through telling them the culture and the heritage of the island. Uh, through 20 different galleries, we start to explain the reasons why these people would have had to emigrate from the island of Ireland. And really what we want to do is bring people on a journey through Irish history. And we want to show that the people that left Ireland, these 10 million Irish people that left all, uh, the island of Ireland for various reasons, either being forced out of the island because of famine or recessions or uh, religious persecution or going abroad for, to further opportunities, or to further their own uh, quality of life for them and their family. We want to show where they went to. Uh, we want to show how they traveled. We want to show where they, where they would have landed in their new world and what these people would have gone on to achieve. But not only these people who would have been first generation Irish leaving the island, we really want to celebrate the Irish diaspora all over the world and tell their stories. So essentially what Epic does is it celebrates uh, Irish people all over the world. Um, we discover Ireland from the outside in, and we do this through the stories of these men and women that left Ireland. So very much what we want to do is um, explaining the story of emigration, but very much talking about the culture and the heritage that these people um, left Ireland with. Um, 
when you visit Ireland and when you visit any museum around the world, sometimes you have a good good sense of what a museum actually is and what the story tells and what it's about. Uh, with Epic, because we're a relatively new museum, which we only opened in 2016, uh, so it's only uh, only opened a little over four years. Um, Epic um, was, was always kind of, people were really intrigued about the story of Epic and what it told, because when you go to places like the Jemison, um, the Jemison Distillery, you know the experience that you're going to get. You're going to learn how uh, whiskey is distilled, you're going to get the history of Jemison. And sometimes Epic is, um, as well as learning about immigration, there's so much more that people can actually get to learn about Irish people and what it means to be Irish. And essentially what we want to do is celebrate these individual people. So some of the people that you're going to see on screen here are the epic characters. Of the 10 million Irish people that left Ireland, we focus in on 388 individual stories of these Irish people and people of Irish descent all over the world. We have on screen here Mother Jones, and she was born in County Cork, and she had an influence in, in very much in the trade union side of things in the United States. We've also got Terence Powderly, who again was a change maker. He fought for rights. He fought for uh, people's union rights. Uh, we also celebrate human rights as well. So through these individual people, uh, whether they're immigrants or people that lived abroad for a time or also people of Irish descent, we want really want to explain what Irish people have gone on to achieve all over the world. And what we do at Epic is we break it up into different subjects through 20 different galleries in the museum. We break up the story of Ireland, its culture, its heritage over 1500 years. We look at the motivating factors as to why people were leaving. And then we break it up into various subjects such as politics, such as literature through our writers, our actors, our poets, our sports stars and sporting legends, people of Irish descent. And what you start to get here is a, is a, is a theme of what Irish people have achieved. And sometimes it's it's the people that, that the lesser known stories in the museum that I actually absolutely adore and love these snippets of information that we get to find out. This is one of my favorites, Connie Mack. His parents were from Ireland. And some of the information that you get to hear about here where Irish people had an influence on Major League Baseball. Um, here again is one, one that's very, very current. This is something that we'll have to update in our museum over the next couple of weeks. Um, with Joe Biden being the president-elect, he will become the 23rd of 46 US presidents to have Irish heritage. And in museum, we bring through people through the names and the details and stories of the other 22 US presidents that have those Irish links. So this starts to explain the really strong links between Ireland and the United States. Um, We'll, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, later on about the, the actual answer to our question about the number of Irish um, that, uh, that are the number of Americans that claim Irish heritage. But here, um, just to give you a little bit of a taster, we are essentially doing a virtual tour of the museum now, um, just so you, you can get a little bit of a talk about the stories uh, in the museum and what it feels like to walk through. We actually do have a virtual tour that we built over the last couple of months in COVID times. Uh, and you can go, you can search for Epic, Epic Museum Virtual Tour and you can go onto our website or go onto your cell phone uh, and actually get to tour through the museum because we have so many of these videos and audio content and pictures and images of the stories and the people that we talk about in the museum. So I would recommend if anyone does want to, to delve a little bit deeper um, and, and wants to go in and see a little bit more about the stories in Epic, please do go on and take a look at that. As I said at the start, nothing is like being there in person though. So we would always welcome you to come and visit the museum uh, when you're next in Ireland. So Epic actually stands for something. And this is always one thing that I want to get convey and get across. Epic, um, E-P-I-C, it stands for every person is connected. And this really strengthens and tells the story of, um, of what we talk about in Epic. So the, those connections, those 10 million Irish people that emigrated from Ireland over the 1500 years, they made a connection in their new world. So whether they went to the United States or Canada or Great Britain or France, Germany, India, South America, Australia, New Zealand, all of these people had an influence all over the world and where they went to, and they made a connection in their new world. So whether they were a laborer or whether they were a nurse or a doctor or whether they were um, jobless and were looking to, to leave Ireland and to seek a fortune, they, had, they made a connection. They made a new, um, a new country their home. And the connections that they made uh, still uh, reverberate back to Ireland as well. And the people of Irish descent also have a connection back to Ireland. They may have a connection back through family that are still actually living in Ireland, uh, or they may have a connection through a love of Irish music or Irish dancing. They may have a connection to our sports stars uh, or our politicians. 
They may have a connection through um, our, our scientists or the people that went on to discover. Because essentially that's what we talk about in Epic. We connect the dots. We connect the story of the people that left Ireland with the, the people all around the world. And 5.1 million of those people that emigrated from Ireland over the time period that we're speaking about, um, 35 million of those would claim Irish heritage now. So it really starts to explain the really strong Irish American connections that we have, um, that, that we're, we are seeing uh, all the time. Even this week, this past week, where Joe Biden uh, was elected as president, and he has very, very strong Irish links. But what I was doing is the whole world was captivated over the last week with the with the US presidential election. Uh, not only the presidential election, but also the Senate races and, and the races that for Congress. And what really struck me is when I was looking down through the states and you would look at the names and the list of people that were being that were on the ballots, you get to see all these Irish names. And it was really, really striking to see that all the time. And it really just cements these connections, these stories that Epic actually tells. Um, some of the visuals that we've looked through in the museum give you a bit of a sense of how we tell the story. And in the video at the very start, it does mention that Epic is the world's first fully digital museum. Uh, and what this means is basically that Epic is a different style of a museum. It goes to explain the reasons why we would have won back-to-back uh, -back World Travel Awards as Europe's leading tourist attraction, and very much that we tell the story of Irish people and Irish immigration in a different way. We tell it through digital means. So what that means is that we can uh, update the museum quite quickly, which we will have to do uh, with the presidential election. But it also means that walking through a museum, it's it's uh, it's all digital. We have a lot of audio content, a lot of video content. We uh, use a lot of motion sensor technology in the museum. There's lots of touch screens where people can actually feel their way through the museum. And that was something, uh, of course, in COVID times when the museum um, uh, was getting to grips with COVID uh, and, and people didn't or were wary of touching things. So things like this, we actually really learned uh, how to adapt. And we everyone that came to the museum then would get a stylus pen. So they didn't actually, actually have to physically touch uh, any of the screens. They were keeping themselves um, nice and safe as they were walking through the museum. But getting back to how we tell the story in the digital sense, the museum is broken up into 20 different galleries. Everyone that comes to the museum gets a lovely Irish passport. So whether they are of Irish descent or not, they're going to be Irish for the time period that they're in the museum. And it's designed as a self-guided museum. So people can use the passport to guide themselves through. They get to stamp their passport in each of the galleries. And what they get to see on the passport is what they're actually getting, the, the subjects that they're actually getting to look at. So for example, we celebrate individual Irish culture and heritage in our music and dance gallery, as well as learning the stories about the individual people. They actually get to, to do a few uh, steps of river dance and um, they get to see the original river dance uh, and how it started to spread all over the world and, and had an influx uh, then um, of, of Irish people dancing all over the world. So really, that's just to give you a little bit of a sense of what the museum feels like in the story that it tells. The next part of what we're actually going to move on to is looking at that Irish heritage, is looking at the people of Irish descent. So for those of you, there's some of you that may be watching, you do have Irish descent. You may have done some um, of your genealogy and your ancestry before, uh, and maybe you just want to get back to it, or maybe you've hit a, hit a wall and you just need to find out more. Or maybe you're one of those people that know you have Irish heritage, but you've never looked into it or never kind of gone into it. So we want to talk a little bit about that. So Liz is going to play a lovely video here called The Power of a Name, which just tees up um, the ancestry and genealogy section uh, with our partners in Epic. Perfect. Thanks, David. Uh, actually, um, the other Liz, before we play the video, um, I just need to announce the, the winner of that competition because uh, that was an easy peasy one. And our winner is uh, Sarah Nikiri. Um, now, that was uh, somebody probably thought that would be a hard name for us to pronounce, but that's an Irish name, so I can do that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. So um, thanks for that first part of the presentation. That was really great. Um, I have to say I've been in Epic a, a couple of times myself and it, it is a really great experience. And like you said, for a museum that's only there for like four years, it's really established itself like really, really quickly. And there is something for everybody in there. Um, I particularly remember the river dance area where you have all the steps marked out on the floor and the music is there. So it's kind of teaching you, like even if you have two left feet, you know that you can try and do the dance and see how it works out. So everybody has a bit of fun with that. Um, I did have two questions was, um, how long do you usually recommend? I mean, I know you could spend hours and hours there if you read absolutely everything on every wall and every table, but what's the idea? ideal time you know to spend there if you're going to visit 
Yeah, so as I mentioned, the museum is self-guided, so it's very much up to yourself. Um, I would always recommend that people print, uh, spend approximately 90 minutes in the museum because um, mm -hmm. it gives enough time to get through all the galleries in, in nice time. You get a, a nice opportunity to read enough of the museum um, to get a little bit of a sense of the story that we're telling. Um, we have a unique thing in Epic where... Um, as well as being um, housed in the CHQ building with Epic, there's lots of cafes and bars and restaurants. So what we do recommend to people is that um, they can leave the museum and go upstairs and have lunch or have a coffee or just have a break and come back down into the museum if they do want to. You know? But the average time is about 90 minutes. Um, you're right. I have heard people that have spent five and six hours in the museum because there's so much information to go through. It's one of the advantages of being a digital museum is that we can have a lot of content and a lot of stories to tell. Uh, but generally, you'd find about 90 minutes perfect and I, I know you're in there every single day but do you have a favorite gallery um or do you even notice now when you walk through you're just going from a to b or do you stop and have a look and say oh i, didn't oh, I, know do. I do and it's one of the things i really really miss in these COVID times when a lot of us are working from home it's, it's just walking through the museum and, and and you know saying hello to the staff or stopping and chatting and what we love to share uh, in the museum is the stories of what people react to so i do have my own personal favorites but what i love hearing is the staff members say that oh we had a we have a, we had a gentleman from philadelphia come into us yesterday and he really um, you know, bonded with some of these stories of Ir the Irish on the on the east coast of the states, you know. Um, but because we break it up into different subjects, what you'll tend to find is that people are drawn to what they actually like themselves. So, for for, the, for those history buffs, the start of the museum there's a lot of content about the history of Ireland and the culture and the heritage and the reasons why people um, like the socio-economic reasons as to why people were leaving the island. So yes. some people are drawn to that. Me personally, I love the sports section. Um, not only because of the stories that it tells, but also how we tell the story. So as you know, Liz, you've been in the museum, we have this giant screen table. Um, and what we do is we, we have these little QR codes on these little hockey pucks. And what you do is you pick up one of the sports, it can be American football or tennis or golf, and it has a unique QR code on the back. You place it down onto the screen and you twist. So you're interacting with this giant screen and mm -hmm. up pops this information all about these individual sports stars that, uh, again, are either uh, direct Irish um, immigrants or people of Irish descent that have had an influence uh, in in um, in American football. Like we've got Tom Brady uh, in the American football section. But again, as I mentioned earlier, it's always sometimes the stories that you're not, you never knew, or you never realized that maybe that person had Irish um, Irish ancestry or or what brought them uh, to leave Ireland and what brought them to go on and, and, and have an impact in, in their, their field. So I'd always kind of be, tend to be drawn to the sports table for whatever reason. Um, it's, maybe it's just me. <laughs> no, no, no. Okay. Um, so, yes, before we move on to the Irish family history section, we are going to have a quick look at that little video. So if we can play that now, that'd be great. When our ancestors left Irish shores, they left everything behind, except for something that would give them strength, their identity, their power to shape the world. The kind of society we build, the kind of power we generate. What meant everything to them is what they gave you, your name. Epic shares the stories of Irish emigration. This year, we are building a unique exhibition celebrating Irish family names found across the world. Be part of the Power of a Name exhibition and honour your ancestors by bringing your family name home. Another great video there and so true, like a name is really powerful. It really is, you know, your story. So as we head into this section, I'm gonna give out the second question for the prize. So this is the one for the VIP guided tour of Epic with the one hour on-site consultation with the genealogy consultant there, taking you behind the scenes on Europe's leading tourist attraction and allowing you to explore your own family history. This can be booked as part of a package to Ireland booked with tenant tours and we'll organize it all for you. Okay, our question for this prize is, this might be obvious to some people, to some I don't know, but what is the most common Irish surname? And again, the first person to comment correctly will win this prize. And over to you again, David. Great, thanks very much, Liz. Um, so yeah, genealogy is a kind of a, a, a real, um, 
what would you call it a rabbit's warren it, it's somewhere that you can really deep dive and get a, a get kind of get lost in the stories of people's names and, and your own individual history um so what i want to do is bring you through a couple of slides here to just explain how we tell the story in epic um so we're very lucky uh, on site in epic that we we have um, fantastic partners um the irish family history center so in the museum we have uh, our genealogists and what they love to do uh, or what they what they love nothing more than is to get someone to sit down beside them and tell them their story and they will then deep dive into the stories of emigration um, and the stories of the individual family history and i always love this name it's one that they share with me is history remembers the victors and genealogy remembers them all and that's so true for the story um that of ancestry and genealogy that we tell um, in in epic and the irish family history center so we offer a number of genealogy packages so you have a number of different options as to how to experience this genealogy um experience uh, all bookable through tenant tours of course um so you'll see three different uh, consultation packages here uh, and genealogy packages one is the most simplest it's the, it's it's the one the, the, the most uh, easy to get to handle which is the diy so essentially you are doing the genealogy yourself uh, you will get access to all of the online records um, there will be a genealogy expert to get you set up and get you started and to just point you in the right direction but essentially you are doing the genealogy uh, history and, and uh, experience yourself you're, you're deep diving into the stories and sometimes people do, do uh, like to actually do this themselves you know sometimes people don't always want to sit with somebody uh, they don't always want to sit with the genealogist they just want to get access to the records because they want to kind of go and find it themselves and maybe have a sense of achievement of doing it themselves um, so it's really that personal exploration of the records. Um, the uh, more popular ones, though, uh, we always find are the private genealogy consultations. Um, so they're available in three different times. There's a 30 minute, a 60 minute and a 90 minute co private consultation with the in-house genealogists. Um, the 60 minute is one of the ones we have on offer as part of our prize that uh, Liz just um, just spoke about there. Um, but these are the ones where people um, and I mentioned earlier, people may have are just starting their genealogy journey for, at the very beginning and they don't know what to do. They don't know where to start. They don't know what to do. So they can sit with their genealogist uh, and he can bring them through the stories. You know, genealogy is never a thing that ever ends. It's always ongoing. It's that power of a name that we spoke about. You are always searching and finding new pieces of information all the time. So whether you're at the very start of the journey or you're near the end and you've done it for years, but maybe you've just hit this brick wall or you cannot find anything else. To be able to sit with a genealogist here in the museum and go through that and for them to use their expertise um, about, about where to look and what to look and what records possibly might work really well, uh, it's absolutely brilliant. And I did sit with a genealogist a couple of months ago uh, and he brought me through some of my family history that I was always wondering about. And I'll be able to show you some of the examples uh, of what they come up with and what the actual records look like in the next couple of slides. But I did I just want to mention the, the last one here, which is a commissioned research. Um, so this basically is really top of the line. This is three months before you actually arrive to Ireland. So after you've booked your vacation with tenant tours, we will contact you three months in advance of you flying out to Ireland. Uh, and we will gather all the research and the information into the family um, and, and, and what's known. And we will do, our genealogists will do all of the work. Uh, and then when you get to come to the museum, we will sit you down in one of our vaults and we will present your family history to you. So if you've ever seen those programs, who do you think you are or something similar, it's kind of like that. We will present it all to you um, and you will be you will be just blown away, you know, um, with, with, with the, the stories that you'll be able to see. And as well as that, then to marry that with a tour uh, of, of Epic uh, is always fantastic because what you get to do is, the information that you find out about your family history, you get to insert your family story into Epic to see where, um, when they would have left Ireland and maybe some of the reasons why they would have left Ireland in that time period or from that county, uh, as well as where they went to and the reasons why they would have gone to maybe East Coast of the States or West Coast or or the Midwest and things like that. So you get to, you get to kind of uh, see similar stories within, within the museum. So this is some of the examples of my own personal journey that I wanted to share with you. Um, so I sat down with one of our genealogists uh, and this is the piece, this, this is the information that I knew. So this is my, uh, my great grandmother, Julia O'Farrell and her maiden name was Rice. Uh, I knew her birth name, Julia Rice. I knew her year of birth and I knew her general birth location. So for you out there that are maybe starting your genealogy journey, you might not know as much of information like this, 
but this is the sort of information that you're going to start with. You're going to start with your emigrant or the person that you want to find out the information about. Uh, now, sometimes you're working backwards to find out these key pieces of information. Um, other times you might do, need to do a little bit of research yourself to find out one or two of these key pieces of information. But this is what I started with. And from there, what they basically start with is they start to work backwards. They found the birth certificate uh, in 1885, and she's listed here as Julia Rice. So this is kind of a key um, a key thing to point out. And this is one of the, the, um, the interesting things about Irish genealogy records. Um, now, obviously, in Ireland, we only have a certain amount of access to the cer certain records in Ireland um, in terms of national census records and birth certificates and death certificates. Um, but we do rely a lot on parish records and church records as well. Um, but this is just a great example of the name, the spelling change of the surname, where it, it, she, is, she is Julia Rice, but it is, it is down in the records as Royce here. So for someone doing their own genealogy journey, this could be one of the first stumbling blocks, knowing what to look for or what not to look for. Whereas a trained genealogist, our experts know exactly how things might change and how Irish names might be translated from Irish to English uh, and things like that might just change a little bit. Um, we were then able to find the marriage certificate of her parents. Uh, so it's Patrick Rice. Um, and you'll see here some of the information and the townlands that we get to see here as well. Um, so this is just building a picture of my family history with all of the information that we get to find. We have the 1901 Irish census. And again, there's another spelling change here. It's listed as Rice. This is the family. So it's Patrick Rice and Elizabeth Rice. Uh, you see all the names of the sons and daughters. And what's really interesting here, and what I love to see is how traditional names in a family would start to crop up generation after generation after generation. So there's lots of Patricks, there's Johns and Bridgets, Annies. Uh, Julia is the, the lady that we're speaking about, my great grandmother, and my mother's name is Julie. So it just starts to see how things get, get um, handed down from generation to generation. But again, you'll notice the spelling change. They would have listed it here as Rice, R-O-I-C-E, which is a different spelling again. But at the very bottom here, what touches really people, and it touched me the first time I saw it is, Patrick Royce's signature, and this is his actual signature. So you, these are the, the physical, the tangible things that you get to see about your family, which is really, really lovely. Um, the reason I, that I wanted to look into um, my great grandmother, Julia, was that I knew she traveled to the United States. Now she did come back, but I knew the general timeline as to when she traveled to the States. So I wanted to be able to see what sort of records um, people in the United States might be able to find about their Irish ancestors. And this is an example uh, of a passenger list from the 1908 White Star Line. So Julia traveled to the United States with her sister, Catherine. Uh, and this again, it starts to tell you a little bit of the story. It starts to tell you their age. Uh, it's, you're starting to build a picture all the time uh, of, of their journey and the timelines. Um, this then, she was in the United States in 1910 for the US census. So we're able to access not only the Irish records and the British, but also the American, the Canadian, and you're building up this timeline and these records all the time. Now these records, when if you're looking at them yourselves on, on, online, uh, they can be quite hard to look through. So that's why the expert genealogists are able to find them uh, much easier and they're able to actually spot things a little bit easier. Now most of these obviously are um, transcribed and, and but sometimes um, the transcription might be a little bit different. But at the top here, you get to see Julia Rice. She was listed as a servant. You get to see um, her the color her 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 color and she's listed as white here uh you get to see the um the age that she came over to ireland or that she came over to the us in you get to see uh, her place of birth and this is listed as I ireland english which again in 1910 ireland uh, was under the rule of the british empire at that time so you get to see all these different nuances and different uh, pieces of information uh, but there's a huge amount of information in here you get to see the 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 um, address as to where she was. So she was in Brooklyn. Uh, and from here, you start to pick up other pieces of information uh, and you can start to build back and build up this this uh, this family tree. We did know that she did come back to Ireland, but we never knew when. We didn't have an idea of when. So these records tell me that she was in Ireland in 1912, for sure, because this is her marriage certificate to my great grandfather, Joseph O'Farrell. So Joseph O'Farrell and Julia Rice. Uh, you get to again see the townlands. So you get to see the parish records here, and they, the, uh, another more ideas about where to look and more pieces of information. Um, so that just I just wanted to bring you through a couple of what what the actual records look like, and to give you a bit of a sense of how how people actually find and go on this journey. 
what I did want to share with you here as well is this is some of the tips um, on finding Irish ancestry from our genealogists. Because as we mentioned, sometimes people don't know where to start and they might be daunted by the whole experience about how they even go about um, starting on that journey of genealogy. They might be embarrassed to come to Ireland to book a, a consultation with a genealogist and then not know not even one piece of information. So this is just some tips about how to get started. Um, some of it is quite basic, as you can see is to know the name of your immigrant, know who you're actually trying to trace and who you're trying to work back from. But the more information obviously that you do know, the better. So if you know their parents' names, their religion, the country or place of origin in Ireland, it always helps and it always build, helps to build out a bit of a picture. Um, there's things that you can do before you leave uh, the States on your vacation. You can, if you're, if you're living in the area where you, your, your relatives are buried, you can start to go to their, their headstones and see the inscriptions and to get the dates and the information for that. Look up any old documents in your possession. Uh, talk to people, talk to your family, talk to the older generations if you can. Um, there are information that you can look up in the US as well if you need to, uh, easily accessible to you. Uh, but you can check, um, registration draft registration cards as well because that starts to build a picture and give you a little bit of information and all anything that you find is always useful to come and bring um you can bring photocopies of course but to bring uh, some of that information when you do come to ireland and when you do visit epic and when you do sit down with a genealogist because what it does is it just allows them to get a bit of a head start it allows them to go much deeper and to go into the stories of of that irish immigration so hopefully what i'd like to what, what i always like to convey and what i always like to get across on these genealogy journeys is is that just to plant a seed for you, just to get you thinking about actually, it's something I've always meant to do is, is find my Irish roots or find what part of my story is that Irish part, you know? Um, because, you know, particularly over the last couple of months, people people haven't been, been able to travel as freely as they, as they would have wanted to. So there's probably no better time to actually sit down and, and to take all this information out and to go and do this deep dive and learn some of the information that we have on screen so that when you do travel to Ireland on your vacation in 2021, 2022, or in the future, you'll know a little bit about it. You'll maybe want to build your itinerary with tenant tours about where you think your family may have come from. If it's Roscommon or Galway, you'll want to make sure on your itinerary that you're going to be visiting these places. And some of the information that our genealogists can get is they can actually pretty much draw the townland and show where show on the map where your family would have come from. Um, they can show by, by some of the information on the records as to what the house probably would have looked like, you know? It's incredible how much information they can actually show you. Um, we do uh, offer, as well as the, the, the private consultations in-house here in the museum, uh, when you're booking with tenant tours, there is an option on the 90 minute consultation where you can actually do a video consultation for 30 minutes with our genealogist before you leave um, before you leave uh, the States and come to Ireland. So that is always a really useful time to get some of your documents together where you can actually do face to face with the with the genealogist. Uh, and they can just tell you, right, if, if you if you're able to find out this piece of information or if you want to bring that record with you, I'll be able to look at it in, in a little bit more detail. Um, so that's just a, a little option that I thought I mentioned. But that's pretty much all from me for now. So thank you for listening. I hope you found it a little bit um, enlightening, uh, a little bit entertaining. Um, but always, as I keep saying, there's nothing like actually being in Dublin, coming and visiting uh, us in, in Epic. Uh, and we'd love to welcome you and to walk you all through the museum and, and discover why Ireland is celebrated all around the world. And as I always say, when I bring people through the museum is I always kind of stop and trick them and ask them, what date is March 17th? What day is it? Uh, some of them actually, they, 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 they stop in their tracks, but most of them know it's St. Patrick's Day. And what I always like to say is for such a small little island on the west coast of Europe, uh, what the Irish people have achieved all over the world is always shown every single year in March the 17th. Now, people celebrate it differently. Some love to read Irish books and poems mm -hmm. and to recite um, their favourite works of Irish literature. Others like to go to the pub and have a drink of Guinness or a, a whiskey. Other people like to go and listen to Irish music. So people have their connection back to Ireland in a little bit of a different way. But March the 17th is always that day of celebration where the whole world stops and turns green. And for such a small little island, it really shows you that influence and what Irish people have gone on to achieve. So um, I'll leave you with that. Later.
Brilliant. Thank you. Well, here, fingers crossed, uh, next year we will actually have a St. Patrick's Day celebration of some description. So um, thanks very much. There's some really useful information in that for anybody, as you said, starting out on that journey. And it's really interesting, like the, the name changes that you mentioned, like that's fascinating. That's changed like three times. That, well, um, and that gets people of, stuck. Absolutely. It really yeah, gets people well, stuck. Imagine. And it, like you said, it's like a rabbit hole. Like once you start getting into it, you know, you just kind of keep going down, 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 down. I mean, my, on my father's side, our descendants are French. So imagine going down that rabbit hole. So that'd be like the French Huguenots that were thrown out of the country during the revolution. So uh, our name has so many spellings and it's definitely not, you know, an Irish name and it's A-U-N-G-I-E-R, but it, originally it might've started as A-N-G-E-R-S. So you should see the mail that I get and the, the spelling variations I get of my name, it's, uh, it's hilarious. Anyway, so yes, as I said, hopefully that will give anybody wanting to start on this little journey uh, some insights. And this video will be up on our Facebook page later. So if you wanna go back and rewatch it or pause it and take screenshots for those tips that David gave, that would be a good idea just to have a look through all of that information there. Now, I do need to um, announce the winner of our competition. And um, Marcia, I hope I get this name right. Okay, it's Marcia Boozel Crivis. I hope I've done that justice, but congratulations to you and uh, to Sarah. So Liz from the office will be in touch with both of you guys to um, talk about getting your prizes to you. So um, I did see something coming up from a Susan Slane, and that's a surname that I haven't really heard very much. But I, I don't know if you know Susan, but there is um, a village in County Meath called Slane with this castle there. So if you do ever come over to Ireland, you uh, you have to go and check that one out. Um, I did see that you're you're starting on this journey to um, to do this research. So good luck with all of that. Now, just going to wait and see if anybody has any questions to ask us. Lots of great comments on the museum, David. Quite a few people have been there and loved it and loved the concept. So, Lovely. Yeah, that's good to hear. And hopefully you will be open again very soon. Yeah, we're uh, just for those watching, we're currently closed because of COVID. Um, so hopefully we're, we're all in lockdown here in Dublin or, or kind of a... A semi lockdown. It doesn't feel the same yeah. as it did the first yeah. time around. I don't know if you're if you're the same, Liz, but we are all um, adhering to to the, the recommended guidelines. But hopefully, we're going to open up uh, in in early December again to welcome lots of people back. Hopefully, it's looking good at the moment, anyway. So yeah, things are going the right way. Okay, um, I don't think we have any questions there, but um, we'll keep an eye on those and we can um, come back to them. We do have a short survey um, that we are going to put in the comments. So if you have a couple of minutes to fill a survey in for us, we will really appreciate that. And in the meantime, I guess just want to say thanks to David for giving up his time this evening to join us. We really appreciate it. It's been really interesting and lots of good comments on the, the Facebook page I'm watching here. So everybody's enjoyed it, which is great. And um, as I say, it will be up on the Facebook page. So keep an eye out for that. Do keep an eye on the um, Epic Facebook page as well, because your page has some quite good content there and online seminars and events that you run both on Irish history and on genealogy as well. So that's a good one to follow. Uh, also do keep an eye on ours, of course, as well for details of any new events, which we'll be announcing very soon. And I think that covers everything. So thanks a million, David, for joining us. Thanks everybody thanks. for watching and hopefully we'll see you all again very soon. Bye-bye. Thanks all, bye-bye.